Hello and welcome to Viewpoint. She is the first woman and the youngest to hold the number two spot at the AFL-CIO. With us today is Liz Schuler, the Federation's Secretary Treasurer. Liz, thank you so much for coming by Viewpoint. Good morning. Thanks for having me on the show. Okay, I have to ask my favorite question in the world. Tell me your union story. Wow. Uh, so I got started as a very young activist in my home area of Portland, Oregon, uh, in the great Northwest. And I started out as an organizer. And it was an unlikely story because I was working at the local electric utility company, Portland General Electric. And I worked in the payroll department. And the women at the utility were clerical workers that were not in the union. And the men, the power linemen, and the folks who did uh, you know, the maintenance of the electrical grid were in the union, in the electrical workers union. And so the clerical workers decided to organize. And I became a part of that effort and um, the campaign was really intense. Uh, unfortunately, the company came at us with everything they had and ultimately that campaign was unsuccessful, but it, in me, I guess I became, you know, the organizer that I that I always wanted to be and went to work for the union after the campaign. You know, I think it's so funny because so many people when I say, tell me your union story, they start with an organizing situation. It, right. it seems like that is that first jump. And once you do it, if you love it, you love it forever. And that's the end of it. I think we're all organizers at heart. And the work that we do really does require organizing skills and everything. So now you've worked your way up, number two at the AFL. Wow, that's a lot on your plate. I know you are always running. It's very early here that you stopped by, so I appreciate <laughs> that. But I know, how's it been going? Is it, um, is it everything you thought it was gonna be? So yeah, I'm the chief financial officer, I guess you might say, as secretary treasurer here at the AFL-CIO, and we wear many hats. So I'm not only managing the dues money, and, and as machinists, of course, you're very interested in how the AFL-CIO is using your dues money, course, and we try to spend it wisely. Um, but I also wear uh, several other hats. Um, I've, since being elected six years ago to this position, I have had a passion around organizing and engaging young people. So I look after and, and, and lead that program uh, within the AFL-CIO. I've been also very interested and, and active and involved in workforce development and training. And really as, as part of innovation and the future of our labor movement and how do we how do we grow the union movement? And I think it's um, all around reaching young people, making sure we have, we're on the cutting edge of training and workforce development and appealing to, you know, workers of color and women and really opening our doors even wider than we ever have before. Well, the face of the labor movement is changing, but we still need to encompass everyone. But how do you bring them all together? Sure, and the AFL-CIO actually has a number of constituency groups, what we call constituency groups, that um, originally were intended to be a space where people felt that their voices would be heard. And if you were a woman in the labor movement, perhaps you know, 60 years ago, uh, you might not have felt like you had the place at the table. And so the groups were designed, for example, Coalition of Labor Union Women, um, designed to provide that space. And now it is true that um, um, the labor movement is is opening up its doors wider than ever, so we need to integrate um, the issues that matter to not only women and young people, people of color, but essentially every aspect of working life uh, in the country now is the labor movement's priority because it's not just about our union members, while they're obviously the most important priority, but we need to be a voice for all working people. And certainly the workplace is changing, so the union movement should change with it. Well, and it's an election year, so we do need to think about that. No matter what side of the aisle you stand on, we still all want better, stronger worker rights, worker benefits. So what are the issues that we're going to be hearing about during the year as each candidate kind of stops and stomps in each city? What are the issues that workers are really going to be paying attention to? 
I don't know about you, but this has been a fascinating election season so far. Um, I don't think we could have ever predicted the way the debate has evolved um, on both sides of the aisle. Uh, certainly, we've been watching the Democratic primary season very closely because we have two candidates that have really put worker issues front and center, which that's the good news is issues like uh, the TPP, for example, that you know was sort of a wonky um, you know, issue that maybe not a lot of people would talk about normally in an election, but it has become one of the main core economic issues that people are Which talking about. Which was surprising about. because a lot of people didn't understand it when it first came out and now I have people on the street come up to me and say, oh, this TPP, and I'm pleasantly shocked. That <laughs> right, which shows doing. that you have been doing your job, That's right? Very that good, the very Machinist good. Union and others have been educating their members and really mobilizing and galvanizing working people to say no to unfair trade deals. But trade is one issue, um, and you know, just the issue around uh, fairness in wages and wages and the economic situation we find ourselves in in the country and what we're going to do about it, that the people we elect are the, the ones that are making the rules and and if we don't have a robust debate um, right now as the presidential candidates are lining up then when will we have that debate and you're actually seeing it on the Republican side as well where um, you know the candidates the front runners have been talking about um, jobs in America and you know how working people are struggling now their prescriptions for how to change things are quite different but um, I think it's exciting to see that um, working people's issues are front and center. Do you think that workers are getting their message across in terms of it's time to pay attention to us, it's time to look our way? Absolutely, and you've seen um, movements take hold you know, the Fight for 15, for example, I think is a good example of workers coming together collectively in a new and different way. They're not in a union yet, but the idea is that we make our voices heard, we're out, you know, demonstrating and um, holding the candidates responsible for their positions on issues like wages and, you know, the minimum wage is just one piece of a fair wage or raising wages agenda that the labor movement fights for. And I would argue that economic issues like equal pay for women, equal pay for equal work, that's a raising wages issue. Um, you know, collective bargaining and being able to fight for a fair wage in a union contract setting, that is a raising wages issue. Um, paid sick days. Uh, well, paid sick leave is somebody, or paid family leave is something that people keep hearing about and now I'm having people outside of the union say, wait, what is that? Explain that to me. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm thrilled by that, that it's, it's getting out there. Well, it's shocking to a lot of people that 40% uh, of private sector workers don't have paid sick days. And in the union movement, that's something we fought for over time and most of our contracts do address um, paid time off. So I think, you know, it's hard for people to understand or get their heads around who've had that right or that benefit. And it's up to us to actually fight to make that uh, accessible to, to everyone. Because as we know, especially in some of the sectors that are the, the most low paid sectors, um, service sector, retail sector, the restaurant industry, where people are coming to work sick and they have to choose whether they actually make a living or take care of themselves and their families. And that is, that's not right. So I think the labor movement has been on the front lines of fighting for that benefit for everyone, not just our members. And I don't think a lot of people realize that, you know, the labor movement is a voice for working people, not, you know, we're not an exclusive club. It's, it's really about access um, to rights and, and um, fairness for everyone. Why is that though? I mean, I always, outside of our four walls or outside mm -hmm. of the labor movement, I do have to explain that to someone on the street that you should care about the sick leave because you go to these restaurants and if the workers <laughs> there are sick, right. you should care that they're sick. Why have we, why are we not getting the props we kind of deserve here in the labor movement? Yeah, that is, I, if I knew the answer to that question, uh, I could solve a lot of problems, right? Um, I feel like uh, the labor movement for many years perhaps um, had it pretty good, you know, back in the heyday when we had union density and it was 
um, at some of the highest levels and, and peaked, I think, around in the mid-70s. Um, we were negotiating contracts that each year got better and better and better, and we were pretty concerned with just maintaining what we have and improving what we have. Um, and then density started to decline, and we know that causes all kinds of problems, not just for our ability to bargain, but really for our voice in the overall economy, our strength in leveraging um, the laws that get passed in Congress and um, the ballot initiatives that we see you know, in various states. And so I think we became more and more insular um, when we had the density, and then as our density declined, we, we started to um, wake up and realize, wait a second, um, you know, we got to start talking to other people outside our movement and start organizing and, and leveraging the power that workers have because, you know, we're the strength in this country if we just exert our power. Um, so I think that's what it's about now is trying to figure out how we show the public it's in your best interest to have strong unions. And I think sometimes people think when there's an attack on unions that, oh, that doesn't affect me. I'm not in a union, but in fact, it does because we are the only institution left standing that is out there trying to balance the economy and, and take what now is runaway inequality and start to bring that more into balance. You know, we know that the rich are getting richer and we know that the powerful few have um, the keys right now. And so if the union movement isn't out there fighting for everyone, um, it will continue to get worse. Tell me about 2016. What is this year going to be about for the labor movement? We're going to keep fighting for that. Let everyone know we're here and we're strong. We're staying. You know. Of course. What else is going to happen in 2016? It is an election year, but that's not the only thing we kind of have on the books. Of course. And I think the election year is an opportunity for us to really get the issues out there front and center. What about retirement security? Making sure that people actually have um, you know, a pension or a retirement that they can rely on when they've put in, you know, the hard day's work for a hard day's pay for a number of years, you should be able to retire with dignity. What about making sure that people have paid time off, whether it's sick leave or family leave, um, to care for either your children, yourself, or a family member? Um, should we have to choose between going to work and making sure our families are taken care of? Absolutely not. So we need to continue to fight for legislation um, and candidates who will support that legislation in 2016 will be uh, the perfect time to do that. So it's going to be busy. Basically. It's going to be a little busy. <laughs> Liz, thank you so much for coming by Viewpoint. I hope you come back again, especially to talk about elections closer to the time. Good. We'll look forward to it. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for this edition of Viewpoint. We'll see you next time.